In nature, all living organisms, beginning with the very, very small ones, such as individual bacterial cells and ending with the very large and complex ones, such as human bodies, that consist of trillions and trillions of individual cells, all living cells contain DNA as the carrier of genetic information. And what that means is we have the DNA molecule that is used to store the genetic information that is basically transcribed into the RNA molecule and then it's the RNA molecule that is ultimately used to synthesize the many different types of proteins that are used by that cell and needed by that cell to survive. Now, in human cells, we have linear molecules of DNA, and what that means is we have a beginning and we have an end. But in other organisms, for example, bacterial cells, they have circular DNA molecules, and what that means is they don't have a beginning, they don't have an end, they are continuous, as we see in the following circle. Now, linear DNA molecules and circular DNA molecules are actually relatively large and relatively long. And if we zoom in into the cell of either bacterial cells or our own human cells, we're not going to see these DNA molecules existing in the following form. Instead, the linear DNA molecules found in our own cells and the circular DNA molecules found in bacterial cells are going to condense via this process of supercoiling. Now, supercoiling basically serves two important biological purposes. Number one, we actually want to be able to fit that long DNA molecule into the nucleus of our own cells and into the cell structure of that biological cell. And to do that, we have to basically condense the structure into this supercoiled form, into this very compact form that is much, much smaller. Now, the second function of supercoiling is to basically affect the different types of processes found inside our body. For example, when inside our nucleus of the cell we replicate DNA, we have to unwind that double helix structure. And when we unwind that double helix structure, the process of supercoiling can basically stabilize that unwinding process. And we'll discuss exactly how that takes place when we'll focus on DNA replication. So the point is inside the cells of these living organisms, these DNA molecules don't simply exist as linear DNA molecules or as circular DNA molecules. Instead, they are usually supercoiled into these supercoils and superhelices that are much more condensed and much more compact. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all, all living organisms, including individual cells and those organisms containing many, many cells, all these cells contain DNA as the carrier of genetic information. Now, although some viruses do contain DNA as that carrier of genetic information, other viruses, such as, for example, the tobacco mosaic virus, TMV, contains RNA as the carrier of genetic information. So, this is in contrast to living organisms that contain DNA and always DNA as the carrier of the genetic information. So, what exactly is a virus? Well, a virus is this non-living agent that consists of a protein capsid, and inside the protein capsid we have some type of genetic information. Now, that genetic information can either be in a form of DNA, like in living cells, or in RNA, but we'll never find both DNA and RNA. It's either this DNA or this RNA, never both. Now, what these viruses basically do is, because they cannot reproduce on their own accord, what they do is they move from one host cell to a different host cell. They infect these cells by injecting their genetic information, and then once inside the cell, they use the machinery of the cell to basically reproduce and form other viral agents. 
For example, if we look at the tobacco mosaic virus, the tobacco mosaic virus is actually the first virus that we discovered. And this tobacco mosaic virus consists of this protein capsid, a helical protein capsid that consists of 2,130 identical polypeptide subunits. And these subunits form this helical protein capsid and inside that capsid, we have a single-stranded RNA molecule, and it is uh, it is given by 6,000. 390 nucleotides in length. So this is the length of that particular uh, RNA molecule inside this virus. Now, once the tobacco mosaic virus actually infects that host cell, it injects the RNA molecule into that host cell. And the special thing about this RNA molecule is it contains the genetic information that codes for a special protein known as RNA-directed RNA polymerase. Now, Remember, inside our bodies, we take the DNA and we form the RNA molecule by using a special type of RNA polymerase. But inside these viruses, this RNA polymerase actually transcribes RNA molecules from other RNA molecules and not DNA to RNA as it takes place inside our cells of the body. So there are many examples of viruses in nature that follow this same pathway that is followed by the tobacco mosaic virus, that is, they form RNA agents or RNA molecules from other RNA molecules. Now, another interesting category of viruses are the retroviruses. And one example of a retrovirus is HIV. So remember, HIV is that viral agent that causes AIDS in humans. So all living organisms basically produce RNA from DNA. So in our body, for example, we take DNA, then we transcribe it into RNA, and then the RNA is used to synthesize a variety of different types of proteins. But the special thing about these retroviruses is, and that's actually where they obtain their name, they are able to actually synthesize viral DNA molecules from RNA, and that is in reverse of what happens in our own cells and all other living cells. So, however, a category of viruses called retroviruses can synthesize DNA from RNA by using a special type of protein that is found in that retrovirus known as reverse transcriptase. And so one example is the HIV agent. So let's take a look at the following diagram to basically see how retrovirus actually works. So inside the protein capsid of the retrovirus, we have two single strands of RNA molecules. So retrovirus has two copies of a single-stranded RNA molecule. And once that retrovirus infects that host cell, it injects these two individual RNA molecules into that host cell. Now, because it carries that special enzyme known as reverse transcriptase, this enzyme basically binds onto either of these two viral RNA molecules and it begins to transcribe in the opposite direction to how it normally takes in our own cells. So instead of going from DNA to RNA, this goes from RNA to DNA in reverse. And so eventually we synthesize these complementary viral DNA molecules. And once they separate, once they anneal, uh, actually, right, so once so once these two blue strands actually separate, these two blue strands, because they're complementary with respect to one another, they can basically anneal. And to anneal means to combine to form that double helix structure. And once we form the viral double-stranded DNA molecule, that DNA molecule is brought into the nucleus of the cell, and inside the nucleus, a second type of special protein enzyme known as integrase basically cuts the host DNA molecule, so the green DNA is the host DNA, it cuts a section of that DNA molecule, it opens it up, and this double-stranded DNA molecule that came from the virus basically injects itself, integrates with that host DNA. And this is how the majority of retroviruses actually work. 
So we conclude that although in all living cells, DNA molecules are the carrier of the genetic information, in some living organisms, we have linear DNA molecules, and in others, we have circular. Now, in any cell, we're never going to find these forms. Instead, they're going to be supercoiled into these compact structures. Now, unlike in living organisms, some viruses contain DNA as the carrier of genetic information, but in others, it's the RNA that is used to carry that genetic information. And as we saw just a moment ago, some of these viruses can actually synthesize DNA molecules from RNA, which is in reverse to how it normally takes inside our cells and inside the cells of all living organisms found in nature.